for our next thing. So the earth, so sun's 4.6, I'm just gonna say B, earth over here uh, is 4.5, you know, so out of the accretion disk of all this like protoplasmic dust, the earth formed a long time ago. Um, the first life, you know, so here we're spiraling out of the sun, which is where all the elements, and I'm just going to say like carbon, nitrogen, you know, the, the elements, you get the point. They're pretty sure that where all the heavy metals came from was that uh, situation I was describing of two neutron stars colliding in which just like it's a cataclysmic collapsing of matter that results in a black hole. But in, when a black hole is formed, there's this ejecta, they call it the ejecta jets, and they basically go out the top and the bottom of what becomes the black hole disk. They're pretty sure that's where all the like gold, platinum, uh, silver, palladium, iridium, uranium, plutonium, all that stuff came from is episodes like that. And imagine the force of two neutron stars forming a supermassive black hole. It's large. And in space, there's no resistance to anything. Things just go forever until they hit something. So the Earth back here, when we didn't have an atmosphere, was blasted numerous times as these neutron star episodes occurred. So all the gold, all the silver, all the platinum, all the heavy elements, metallic elements came out of these kind of things. So isn't it so interesting that we wanna adorn ourselves, or some of us perhaps, with gold and silver that had their origins in these in just unfathomable cosmic events. And, you know, Steiner talks about this as like different civilizations where like silver or bronze or, or copper or gold. And it's, it's interesting. Careful with that. Okay. It's really heavy. I would hate for it to fall on bare feet. Um, so, anyhow, that's a little aside. The first water, and I'm just going to say W. Are you trying to lower that? 4.4 billion years old. They're pretty sure there's giant clouds, clouds, term used usefully, I mean, like loosely, in space of water, just out there floating around. So it's somehow some of it, like I think our solar system, our solar system is not doing the static thing, that whole like image that you grew up with of like the sun and then Mercury and Venus and all that. That's as wrong as like a flat earth, literally, and yet it's what we teach in science classes. It's like, and Nassim Harriman is a fascinating, sometimes correct, sometimes twisting, you know, exaggerating the details. Uh, but he's got some cool talks out there, um, physicist. So if my sun is the earth and all the planets are like my fingers, what's going on is this is happening through, the, our solar system is moving around the galaxy. So where you are on your birthday this year is 11 billion miles distant from where you were last year. So it's much more a corkscrew than this image of the plane of the ecliptic. So what I think happened through here, as I was describing those heavy metallic elements, probably water too, the earth passed through a cloud of water. And because we had enough of a, a you know, gravitational pull and then an early proto-atmosphere, it was able to stay. So fascinating. If you go to Mars, there is a Grand Canyon on Mars that would be the equivalent of 3,000 miles long, five miles deep. That would be like a Grand Canyon from New York to LA, five miles deep on Mars, which is a planet half the size of the Earth. There was a lot of water on Mars a long time ago. To do that kind, there's a volcano on Mars, 81,000 feet tall, almost three times taller than Everest. So, like, what's happened over the great span of time is is more than really my imagination can grasp. So, anyhow, first water, first life, 3.7 billion years. Uh, we'll just say life. So, you know, pretty pretty early in the you know early evolution of the the Earth. You know, just seems like it was probably still cooling off. And they're pretty sure, I have a friend, colleague, he's an astrobiologist at UC Santa Cruz. Bruce Damer is his name. And he was part of a team that has a alternate theory for the evolution of life on Earth. And we're all taught like, oh, it, life began in the oceans, which is a very nice, like poetic kind of thing. But what happens in water? Do things go into, do they smoosh together to become something or do they go into solution? Solution. Yeah, life didn't start in water. 
it started, according to my friend, who knows more than I do, and he's on the Mars rover team for NASA, and he's a crazy, frizzy-haired, psychedelic-taking burner. Burns? Bruce Damer is his name. And it, yeah, there, it's in Scientific America. I could share the article. It's, this is not fringe science. It actually beat out the North American eclipse for the cover story of Scientific American, which is saying something because the eclipse is a big deal. That basically they believe life started in these like geothermal little volcanic vents in Australia or what's now Australia, where 71 uh, amino acids bombarded the earth before we really had an atmosphere in little micrometeorites, little pea sized, just, you know, space dust constantly raining down on the earth, which is still happening, but most of it gets burned up in the atmosphere. So we're not getting pelted by, you know, micrometeorites, 71 amino acids. How many amino acids do you need to make proteins? How many? Yep. Yeah, 21. So we had like more than ample. So you can imagine we've got a pool that like bubbles up out of the earth of water, probably full of like hydrogen sulfide and all sorts of other nasty stuff. Micrometeorites raining down on it, hot sun, dries it out, dries it out, smooshes all these amino acids together over and over and over again. Sublimation, pushing these, you know, amino acids together. And then you get, remember from our sources of nitrogen, talk in the field earlier, lightning, big electrical source, and voila, you have lipids, the, the first proteins building blocks of life right here. And they're pretty sure. And so my friend Bruce is like, hey, yo, NASA, don't be sending the Mars rover thing. You'll get one shot. Get that thing over there down into the old ocean basin looking around for life. Go to where there's geothermal vents. So he's you know, trying to get them to pay attention to what they've learned around this idea. So it's fascinating how like we can be in this time and know so much and be making decisions that affect so much and still not even really understand these really basic things. And they've been able to simulate this taking amino acids, big, doing a big electric jolt and, and create um, lipids. So this isn't like, I mean, it is theoretical because no one was here, um, but they've been able to simulate this in a lab. Well, proteins, which is like the next step would be lipids. So, um, yeah, so but the first proteins, and then I don't know how DNA formed. That No one else, there's some ideas around that. Um, anyone have any ideas? Let's talk about it later. <laughs> that part is truly fascinating. And when we really look at it, it's like the, the, the genetic diversity, now that we're getting into sequencing genomes, I think humans were about 30,000 genes. What's the most diverse genome we've sequenced so far in higher life top two they're both really unusual creatures the dolphin octopus. Octopus. octopus yep that's number two what's number one your birthdays are on halloween a few scorpions Eighty thousand genes in a scorpion they're survivors you know so they're like a repository of something that's been able to persist for a crazy long time think eight legs multiple eyes claws stinger they're just like, they're a different animal. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, so as we move through, you know, so this first life was like nothing we would identify as life. So the first prokaryotes was, um, uh, well, I'm sorry, this, this I, I should do here, back up. This was prokaryotes, this is eukaryotes here. Um, this one's 2.7 billion years. So we had almost a billion years. There's some, some uh, conflict about this between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So prokaryote from the Latin means before, carry means like nutshell. Like, so before the cell had a nucleus. So prokaryotic life is pre-nucleic and then eukaryotic is post-nucleic. And an interesting way, I put, I brought out um, biology belief from um, whatever his name, Bruce Lipton. And he's re considered the grandfather of epigenetics. He was a molecular biologist at Stanford that kind of discovered epigenetics back in the late 60s. But basically, we historically have viewed the nucleus as the brain of the cell. And it does contain the DNA, but it's... He argues, so that's genetic theory. 
just like we're in the process of moving from germ theory to terrain theory and before germ theory we're in like miasma the belief that like bad smells made you sick which is just not true and that's why like victorian ladies would wear a scented handkerchief over their mouth because the germs would make you sick so what bruce lipton and other people in the epigenetics world say is the the nucleus is the gonads that's the like reproductive stuff and the brain is the cell wall that's interacting with the environment and there's significant uh theory theoretical evidence that it was viruses interacting with prokaryotic life that could penetrate the cell wall that like opened up a cell and then other cells slipped in and became the various organelles of the cell so, and that actually was a precursor to placental mammals. Because think about like in a female, what an odd thing to have another thing growing inside you. I mean, maybe it's not odd, those of you that are mothers, but insects don't do it that way. Reptiles and fish don't do it that way. Birds don't do it. They like, they lay eggs that have the potential of that. They've got all the right stuff, but it does that other becoming an actual life form outside of it. And Actually, in our junk DNA, we have 8% vestigial viral DNA. It's no longer functional, but it shows back to our, our evolution from this uh, stage of life. And I just think that's so fascinating. So again, eukaryotic means after the, nut, the nutshell had a nut inside it from Latin. You with me? I know they get chicken every day. They squat for hours. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I always think it's cute when chickens, anybody ever seen when like early in the season, sometimes they make those tiny little eggs that ha don't have a, it's like they're prokaryotic eggs or something. They don't have a, a yolk. Um, so, and then shortly after, um, in this uh, time frame, I, I did this a little bit out of order, but um, so three point five billion years ago uh we have photosynthesis so that you know i'm a little out of order here i'm actually i'm just gonna advance this over to here and we'll say eu is 2.7 billion years so what kind of photosynthesis was this any anyone venture a guess yeah cyanobacteria so this was you know cyano and actually before this it was things that we're doing with xanophil with like red pigments. So you can think of like red algae. Red algae was in this zone. So it, instead of working with chloroplasts, instead of green, it was red. And part of this, I'll get to the next thing. Where was that? Um, in this, this whole thing. Yeah, oxygen. This is, well, this was the first oxygen. Uh, in here because think about it like before how like how did metabolism occur back before photosynthesis it was all fermentation of sugars you're just like in the soup in the ocean and you're fermenting sugars whereas once there's oxygen there's actual like you know photosynthesis and carbon dioxide exchange occurring which is why so much of the carbon cycling and the o2 cycle is a marine of origin is because that's like where life started and this is all like a throwback to that time so in this zone in here in this kind of gray area we have our atmosphere was formed and this was actually um what was it it was uh da, da, da. i used to be able to memorize all this stuff but 2.5 billion years ago uh so this is actually the largest extinction event ever on the planet because you had all the life that was before this was anaerobic oxygen was toxic and then you had red algae and then cyanobacteria and all these other things photosynthesizing this huge bloom of oxygen all the life forms that are on the planet that had not evolved with in the presence of o2 died off so in terms of like we look at that one trillion species that have existed on this planet estimated obviously it's a round number since the or you know since here less than one percent are alive now and consider the just like inc insane multitude of life forms now but there was a lot of them that died off back here and they were so simple they were like not visible to the naked eye single cellular things so the first multicellular organism so again this is part of this 
um, possible interaction with viruses, which there's some that argue, uh, many virologists actually, that viruses aren't actually alive. I think COVID only has 20 genes. Human has 30,000 genes. COVID only has 20. It's like, well, it's not a thing. It's just, and so there's some folks that believe in this, what's uh, virus as messenger. What is the term for it? There's a, somebody, no, no, not mRNA. What is it? It'll come to me in a second. It's, it's the idea that viruses are actually like a messenger cell that can like penetrate the cell wall, take a DNA sample and move it to the next one. You ever see any of those scanning electron? Yeah. Uh, well, bacteriophages are like in that weird class of, um, God, I, I can't believe the term. It's, it, again, this is all like emergent science and it's not completely agreed upon yet. But have you ever seen those images of a bacteriophage? They have like legs and they're like walking from one cell to the next. Um, uh, Lyme's disease, the organism behind that is a bacteriophage that looks like a crazy, it's a, like a spirochete. It looks like the moon lunar lander and it has this like corkscrew kind of thing that goes down and like inserts its DNA, but also like gains information from the cell about its like immune system. Um, it can change its like its uh, composition. It's one cell, no nucleus. I mean, this is mind blowing between going from one cell to the next. And then it gets feedback loops from our immune response or white blood cell response and can create biofilms around it to protect itself from attack from our immune system. And then eventually will hide out in our connective tissue, which is why one of the symptoms of Lyme's is joint pain, because you get accumulations of these spirochetes in your joints. It's just amazing, like how, like the, the natural in intelligence, if you will, behind some of these things that they evolved to be such survivors through all these just horrendous, uh, you know, mass extinction events. And they're still here. Yeah. Right. The, the, the disease went down, and a grad student was working on why did the disease pressure go down. Mm -hmm. And she taught me this thing about how I guess when the microbes die off, they leave behind a packet of like protein that kind of explains what it was that killed them. Okay. And the next generation takes it up, reads it, and uses it to to protect itself wow and the carbon was was taking that stuff the protein in because it binds onto dna and protein really well and wasn't making it available and that's why she believes the disease wasn't being transferred as well wow yeah, yeah. it's so cool again the oh <laughs> i know the deeper in we peer um some folks have postulated that it was fungi on an asteroid that uh, you know, colonize the earth with life. Well, right now the oldest evidence of fungi, I like that story. It's kind of a fun one that it was like started with mushrooms, but it's just not proven scientifically. The first fungi is 1.5 billion years old uh, in the, you know, fossil record. Interestingly enough, if you go back 300 million years ago, what were the tallest living life forms on the planet? Yeah, giant mushrooms, like Paul Stamets tuned into this. They found these fossilized, they thought they were uh, petrified trees and they were 30 foot tall mushrooms in the like Mexican rainforest that fell over and they were the tallest living things 300 million years ago. <laughs> Crazy, but it's real. First sexual reproduction, 1.2 billion years ago. So before all of it was just like, um, like fruit flies, whether it's spontaneous generation or just cellular division. Um, and more of like a clonal, like it wasn't sexual. There wasn't actual interaction. And so you can see like the life forms that made this bridge, you know, here we've got multicellular life with organelles and Golgi apparatus and ribosomes and you know, that kind of stuff. There was a lot, that was a big warm up to secular reproduction. So really if we go from 4.5 to 1.2 billion years for 3.3 billion years, it was a really quiet symphony here of like, if you were an alien going over the earth, you're like, yeah, nothing going on there. No atmosphere, um, no, nothing you can see that's life. So imagine, you know, and again, we get into like, this is where the Fermi paradox holds true of like, of all the countless worlds, how come we haven't been visited by aliens or discovered aliens? Well, if they visited <laughs> until fairly recently, we, we never would have known, you know, like our, our, our Paleolithic ancestors just been like, well, that's a trip, but they had no way to write it down. Um, and vice versa, too. So, anyhow, it's fascinating. 
especially if we're in a, a what is it, a galaxy that has 100 billion stars just in the Milky Way. And when you look up in the darkest place on the planet, how many stars can you see? <laughs> Guess, wild number. So many that it's light. 4,000, that's it. If, if the, the Milky Way galaxy that you can see, you know, you can only see one hemisphere's worth, were the size of a dinner plate, we can see a dime. You can see the background glow of other stuff going on, which is the Milky Way like dust. But in terms of actual pinpoints of light with a naked eye, um, 4,000 stars, that's it. Again, that's why it's amazing how little we know. Some geek somewhere, I'm sure. Um, which is why I actually did a little bit of research because I didn't want to be spouting off like weird anecdotal things. So I was going to actual scientific things for all these dates because it's always changing and stuff. Um, so the first plants, so now we're really getting to current times. So this is plants. And, and by plant, we're probably talking more like duckweed or azola than um, something you recognize as a plant with roots, when you, especially when you consider 300 million years ago, mushrooms were the tallest things on the earth. So, and then as we keep moving forward, the first animals, and this is where we're really, yeah, it's, it's getting, getting spicy. Uh, the first animals, and again, we're talking simple, like little like protozoan level creatures swimming around in the ocean. Um, then we had the Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago. I'm running out of whiteboard, but so this is the uh, Cambrian explosion. What happened in between here? Anyone know what happened in this little gap here? They're pretty sure. So and this was like weird, like tube worms and just crazy things. You're like, that's alive. Because, you know, it's not much longer after sexual reproduction. There's this theory of snowball earth that between uh, 500 million years ago to 575 million years ago, or, and some people say 750 million years ago, the whole earth was covered in ice and snow and the albedo effect, the like the whiteness, not racial, but like literally the color white or lack of color, reflected all the sunlight. So we had no clouds and it was just kind of this cold ice ball floating out there. And it was all the life was clustering around geothermal vents down deep in the ocean. There's all these ex extremophiles. I was just reading about there's like a, a new species of octopus, just a little guy, that can hang out in water that's like 350 degrees clustered down by these little volcanic vents and it doesn't boil to death. Um, there are many extremophiles out there. So the snowball earth was like the earth just kind of hung out like that and nothing could really change until a period of volcanism that probably had to do with our proximity to other objects in space or the sun's activity, there's increasing correlation between solar output of cosmic particles. Like the IPCC actually just started to include solar weather data in its climate modeling because there is a pretty strong correlation. Led to a period of volcanism, melted a bunch of the ice, and then you have the Cambrian explosion because then it's like, oh cool, way more ecological niches, all these plants and animals and the prior life forms could get out and have more ecological niches. You with me? Um, so then, you know, and we, we tend to think of like dinosaurs as a long time ago. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it was really kind of like yesterday. So the first dinosaurs a uh, million years ago is dinos. So, you know, the a lot had to happen from this Cambrian explosion to actual like life forms that uh, look like actual life forms to us. So you can think in the grand scheme of things, if we round to 5 billion years, it's only been within the last little tiny blip that we've had like what appear to be higher forms of life that can leave behind fossils and this kind of stuff. Uh, before, uh, you know, bones and things like all most of these did not leave fossils it's all just like people extrapolating kind of guessing um so then i'm gonna just kind of like create a long path over here because it really was a pretty long path um 120 million years ago there's a great author when uh thomas berry no relation to wendell berry wrote a book called the universe story and that was what I got to see a woman that was on his students and she ran a nunnery down like in the Carmel area. 
uh, he wrote a book called The Universe Story, which is like a story of creation from a Christian context infused with evolution of like, hey, we can all coexist. Wow. Like your, your worldview and my worldview can coexist because we have proof of this stuff. So quit holding on to your one book. So 120 million years ago, this was a major moment because this was the angiosperms. So, and also the first birds. So big uh, flowering of life uh, there, you know. So before this, this was all gymnosperms. Anyone want to um, say what what the, that means, gymnosperms? Yeah. Well, what does the word mean? What What do you do? What do you wear in a gymnasium? Shorts. Nothing. Gymnasium means naked place. So. Yeah, the original Olympics and all that was done naked. A gymnasium, you would be naked. That wouldn't go over so well in high school nowadays. Definitely not in junior high. Um, so naked seed, uh, then seed with, within a fruit. So that's the differentiation. A really interesting, if you're in a, the, where uh, Pacific yew grows, do you know this tree? It's a conifer. They actually make these little red berries that are translucent. And you look, it looks like a berry, it looks like a huckleberry. They actually taste quite good. Don't eat the seed because they're poisonous. But if you flip it upside down, you realize it's like a little cup and you can see the seed right there. So it is still a gymnosperm. Um, and so gymnosperms, oftentimes like pine trees are a gymnosperm, all the conifers are. And remember how we were talking about pine trees have the female cones are the female flowers and the pollen cones are the male flowers. So in this evolution from plants over here, these plants, like we're talking simple, but also over in here would be uh, cycads or cy how do I spell that? Cycads, uh, horsetails, um, uh, mosses, ferns. What? Anybody ever looked on the backside of a fern? Do ferns make seeds? They make sport. What the? So like how, how wait, I thought fungi made spores, like how is there actually a correlation? And it shows that one evolves from the other or they evolve through interacting. So lichens are a fungi and an algae. But is, what is algae? Is algae a plant? Algae is a protist. So uh, algae in some way is as different from plants as it is, as we are from animals. So in, if you go way back in this evolutionary pathway, like in here, it's probably somewhere in this range here, we had a branching, a major fork in the road. One way went this way and the other way went to protozoas. So in a way, what this is, these were the precursors to plants because they use photosynthesis. And these were the precursors to animals. So you can think protistas have flagellum. They're like bacteria with those little leg-like looking things. They develop motility. So, but the way life works, because the ocean is like this great cushy repository of the prior life forms, we have those, like we're still coexisting on the planet with these two, and then these two evolved out of it. And then fungi has developed beneficial relationships to lichens and all the other bryophytes. Does that make sense? But it's a cool thing. So like when you go to the ocean to a tide pool and you're looking at all the seaweed, it's like that is a whole other universe that represents an earlier evolution of when this whole photosynthesis event began to occur. And the cyanobacteria just kept morphing and evolving from single cellular to algae. That's basically like a community. And that's one thing Bruce Lipton drives home really well. All life starts as a point and then becomes a super community. So one cyanobacteria is a point when you look at a bullwhip kelp it's a super community of algae and so the same too with like all other organisms you don't have one giraffe they're in a herd and they form a super community you don't have one sheep like we don't have the word shoop like you know like one goose multiple geese because they're always in a super community and he he makes this cool leap to like part of our task is to go from humans to humanity, mm -hmm. to become a super community that we're like one species, one, you know, the, the illusion that racial 
divisions occur and stuff. But that's a cool, you know, just understand that's consistent with how life like bifurcates and branches and sometimes these like, you know, vestigial ones get trimmed off over time as it evolves because oxygen makes it toxic or something. Um, a kind of a cool, uh, yeah, we're at that point. So major, you know, before we had angiosperms, are there any insect pollinated gymnosperms? No, it's all wind pollinated. So earlier reproductive mechanisms tended to be dioecious and um, imperfect flowers. Imperfect. And also wind pollination because you just didn't have the diversity of, of insects. Somewhere in here, there were like uh, dragonflies with 30 inch wingspans and just like mind bogglingly huge insects and stuff. What I just saw uh, fossil evidence, there was a, a scorpion relative five feet long. <laughs> Imagine like mucking around in some swamp and you bump into something and it's like, I mean, obviously people didn't exist at that same time as far as we know. Um, so I'm going to erase. Yeah, this was a big event, but what they're saying, and this is why this, that's why it's cool to like keep studying science because we're constantly learning things. So what they say, Big stuff happened when this hit. I mean, literally the ocean boiling. I mean, come on. Magnitude 10 earthquake. Every point past nine is tenfold increase. So a 9.1 is 10 times bigger than a nine. A 9.2 is 10 times bigger. So a 10 is just unfathomable. Like the part of our axial tilt goes back to this because we got slammed by a sphere the size of Texas. Um, a lot of dust got blown up. A lot of fires got started, you know, 90% of the plants and we got plunged into a nuclear winter. This is another cool thing that this was another paper I read. This is where the birds and mammals began to thrive. And part of it, and here's why this is important to us is seeds. So if you had a nuclear winter for a thousand years dark, how much plant stuff was going on? Could giant brontosauruses make it through here? No, that was the end of the dinosaurs, this one episode, because the whole food chain was based on these giant herbivores that basically floated in this very humid, soupy environment that would support a, a, a skeletal structure that large. And literally the atmosphere was that different that there was more buoyancy due to like just way more moisture in the air. Um, and a lot of plant material just got you know, dusted down, but there was a lot of seeds laid down in that because as plants get too stressful, they can like portend stressful episodes, they make bigger crops of seeds. So there are all these seeds laid down in this dust. This isn't my idea, this is from this paper I read. And little birds and little mammals could scratch around there and survive when the other animals that existed before here perished. And then another thing around the species composition as we moved more towards angiosperms, and obviously there was a huge dip in biodiversity here. You know, we lost a lot of things. Um, they believe that the angiosperms, because they're creating like larger fruits and seeds, all this ash and potassium and uh, phosphorus from the ash jump-started this, the rise of angiosperms and their, their general proliferation. And then you had time for the evolution of all the pollinators too through this time period. So it's just interesting to see like the little steps that occur that make it the way it is now. And so as we move through angiosperms, like what are the hallmarks? We have, uh, you know, insect pollination. We have um, perfect flowers. Um, I mean, there's still when all this is still happening too, but these, these um, reproductive pathways get evolved more and more and more. And if you keep going with this, what's the largest plant family in North America? The Asteraceae, so the daisies, the, whether it's the dandelions or the sunflower, dandelions aren't from North America, but all the little yellow flowers that you see all over the place, except for the buttercups, which are ranunculus. And a lot of them are perfect flowers. So lettuce would be a perfect example of like, okay, so you're a dioecious plant, you're a, a, a ginkgo tree. And you're like one nut, you know, ginkgo nut that got dropped by a bird on this side of the mountain. What are your, the, what's the chances of your survival and, uh, you know, flourishing? None. 
Yeah, you're like, you need two by nature. And chances, and if you only had two, it's like a total genetic bottleneck of, of you know, inbreeding and you're just gonna die out. Um, and again, wind. Wind doesn't go like through mountains, but butterflies and things get swept up in wind storms and get blown big long distances. And I got to do a lepidoptery class with a butterfly moth expert and we'd go up to Siskiyou Crest in the fall and he would literally show, he's like, okay, wait for it, wait for it. Like we'd feel the wind and a big gust of wind would come and all these butterflies would go up and just get blown by wind because they can't fly strong enough. Again, like if you've done the math on like, how in the hell do hummingbirds mig migrate? You know, like the amount of food you'd have to eat as a human to do that kind of journey, like your body, like no way. So they have to kind of piggyback off these other elements. So again, as we see as the evolution of like reproductive biology goes, it's really cool to move towards clonal reproduction like we were looking at the Vinca, where, you know, mammals and other birds and gophers and stuff can move little snippets of you or comfrey around. You don't even need to make seeds or, or lettuce, how like one lettuce plant all by itself can grow and make like an ounce of seed and then birds eat you and spread you all over and you don't need pollinators because you're self-pollinated. Like unless you're a parent, you can't grab, if that was your kid, would you say, no, I'm, I'm ethically opposed to that. You're like, um, this path includes a slow, painful death and they can't like exercise or ever get a cut or anything like that. Or this path is like you can lead a normal life, one shot. So this is where, this is a major crossing of the Rubicon and we'll, we'll look back at this as important as discovering oil, as to, you know, important of these other major thresholds. And maybe I'll just stop our thing here. Because no matter what you or me or any of us believe or even a state or a nation, we're already doing it. And there's a, a scientist in China that illegally CRISPR, using CRISPR, um, altered the fetuses, twin girls, can't get, uh, what is it, diabetes or AIDS? HIV. Yeah, or one other thing. Mm -hmm. And these are like living, breathing human girls that are out there in the, you know, eventually reproductive uh, gene pool of humanity. That scientist came under a lot of attack because that's like, you know, that was a no-no. You're not supposed to engineer humans but it's already happening. And how many have we not heard about that are out there? And so we are looking at uh, horti some horticultural plants earlier, and we'll this will bring it back down to earth. The clematis, it's, I've got one growing kind of on one of the posts of my house. And this is where it begins to be difficult because you get into seed saving. Oh, I want to save seed from that. And what you might not know is that the big, primarily Dutch uh, horticultural flower plant breeding people use radiation and uh, synthetic biology tools, also gene editing tools, uh, cisgenics, a bunch of other molecular biology lab tools to alter something so it doesn't make pollen or all like roses that don't have a smell or, um, you know, it's beyond GMO. Like what is it, Arctic beauty apple? Are you all hip to this? The new, GM, new wave of GMOs, it's gonna be impossible to tell. You'll never be able to do a GMO test for it. Arctic Beauty, they took a wild relative apple from Kazakhstan that doesn't brown and spliced that gene into modern apples. So you can cut up your apples for your fruit platter and they don't brown. It's a GMO, but it's just apple mixed with apple. So it's not a transgenic organism. So we're, we're, we're in this whole new realm and I think we're gonna look back and just be like, oh my goodness. We did not use the precautionary tale. And as I'll close this with uh, Stephen Hawkins, you know, the, he was being interviewed on the BBC once and he was asked like, what are the three greatest risks to humanity? And he said, human stupidity, human greed, and AI. And then the interview was like, that's so hypocritical. You use an AI device for your predict predictive speech thing, you know, cause he can't speak. So he'd use his little computer that kind of guesses what he's gonna say. And he's like, I know we're hypocrites, which is why this is such a threat because we will use it even though we don't understand the potential outcomes of it. And we're beginning to see that. Uh, and we know the prior two exist, stupidity and greed and you know, healthy measure, but the AI one, it's hard for people to grasp because we already totally embrace it with autocorrect that gets better the more you use it, that's AI, or your spam filter on your email. Who, who doesn't want their spam filter to work well? That's totally AI. So it's not gonna look like robots. It's gonna look like, and what did Elon Musk say? The first neural lace implants will be used to cure blindness, 
paraplegics and quadriplegics just through electrical stimulation. And you're gonna say, that's not ethical. They already do it for Alzheimer's patients, a neural implant that makes life way more livable for them and their caretakers. And one in three of us, present company included, will get Alzheimer's or take care of an elder with Alzheimer's. So little device makes it a lot easier or you say no and it's very difficult and you're changing diapers or having somebody change your diapers. So I mean, we're, it's a really fascinating time to be alive and totally terrifying at the same time. So there's, I'm gonna stop there. I know.